There's another way to look at theorem 18, which says that the order characteristic of an odd dimensional compact with a boundary manifold is always zero, which is called Poincare duality. It turns out that if you have uh, the composition of that manifold into a network, you know, with vertices, edges, faces, blocks of various dimensions, various cells, you can, it turns out, always draw an upside and down network. What I mean is, let's take the three dimensional case, that the edge, the upside network is for each vertex you have a face, and for each edge you have another edge, but in a perpendicular direction, and for each uh, top face, you have a vertex and so on. This is called a Poincare duality, or sometimes duality simply. And in fact, there will be a student presentation on Thursday, which will show you an example, the most elementary example, historically the first example of this duality. But anyway, using this upside down duality, you can get this result. But that's maybe a discussion for the next AIMS course. I think. Okay. That's a good um, sampling of how to use the left-hand side of Poincaré Hopf to get the right-hand side. I would like to remind you that Poincaré Hopf is theorem 15 from last time. Next, let's use this same powerful Poincaré Hopf theorem in the other direction. We do right-hand side to the next hand, left-hand side. In other words, how the knowledge of topology controls the behavior of a dynamical system that lives on that manifold. Okay? If you know something about the topology of the underlying space, well, a dynamical system that lives on the space cannot behave in an arbitrary fashion. It has to have lots and lots of constraints on its behavior. Here is probably the most important result in this direction. I shall state it in a way that is different from most treatments of topology that you find in text. But I think this is going to be the easiest form to use. Suppose that you have a vector field or a dynamical system on a manifold vector field on a closed <coughs> orientable manifold. of finite, some finite dimension. Then, I'm interested in the number of equilibria of this vector field. You know, you draw any vector field. We have, for example, drawn here two kinds of vector field on the same manifold. On sigma g, I can draw this kind of vector field or this kind of vector field, OK? And here and here, the number of equilibria was different. Here, I forget how many equilibria there were. Maybe there were 2 plus 2G equilibria. Right? Total. Well, two of them had positive sign, 2G of them had negative sign, so the order characteristic came out to be this way. Here, you had, whatever it is, uh, a lot of equilibria, more than 2 plus 2G. <laughs> okay. So, we see that in this case, there are fewer equilibria than in this case. Here, for example, there are two equilibria, but can you draw a vector field with not two equilibria on a sphere, but only one equilibrium? Or for that matter, can you draw a vector field that has no equilibrium at all? You can ask yourselves that kind of question. Is the question clear? Yeah. So, what is the minimum number of equilibria that you must have because of the topology? The answer is very nice. The number of equilibria of this arbitrary vector field must be bounded below by the Euler characteristic, but the absolute value of the Euler characteristic. This absolute value is important. For example, in this case of sigma g, usually this number is negative. Indeed, for g, Started from 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on, it's all negative. At g equals 1, it is 0. But I'm saying that you can bound below the number of equilibria by the absolute value of this. 
So even if it's a negative number, the absolute value is positive, so this becomes a strong bound. Okay? If we had some negative number on this side, then the bound is completely trivial because number is, of course, number of equilibria is always zero positive. Right? I mean, you can't have minus two equilibria. Okay. Nonetheless, it's good to note that on, the, on this left-hand side, the all equilibria here, when I say number of equilibria, they are all counted positively. You should um, Unlike when we are doing the intersection theory, for example, when we count the number of intersection points or number of equilibria, and like this, gamma zero, um, little circle gamma v, where each equilibrium is counted with positive or negative sign. Okay. So this is all positive. Please be careful. OK. In particular, this is part of the theorem. In particular, because of this uh, inequality, every vector field on S even must have a vector field. I uh, must have, excuse me, equilibria. Must have an equilibrium. A manifestation of what I was talking about, namely that the topology of the manifold, in particular the S even, constrains the behavior of the dynamical system on that manifold. You know that the Euler characteristic of S even is always 2 in all even dimensions. So that's greater than or equal to 2. That means that there must exist some equilibria. In fact, the number of equilibria is going to be at least 2. A little caveat, caveat means warning. When we say equilibria, we are really talking about a generic picture, yeah. not a degenerate picture. It turns out that you can draw a vector field on S2, for example, or S even, that has only one equilibrium, not two. But that's because that one equilibrium turns out to be degenerate, and if you shake it a little bit, if you draw, try to draw the picture on a moving train, if you uh, move it into transversality, if you make the picture generic, you get two equilibria. I shall show you such pictures on the next problem sheet. But in the meantime, just um, absorb the fact that um, if you have non-zero Euler characteristic, your vector field or your dynamical system must have equilibria. In other words, points where you don't move, stationary points. OK? Good. Proof. This left-hand side, yeah, number of equilibria. OK, let's write it like this. Number of equilibria, equilibria, is equal to, I can write it rather awkwardly like this, summation over all the equilibria of my vector field V, but instead of summing index at each point plus or minus one, I'm going to sub just, sum just plus one. Okay? For each equilibrium, I just give plus one. That's going to give you the number of equilibria, of course. But this plus one can be interpreted as the absolute value of the index of V at, at X. Right? Because the index of V at X is plus or minus one. So if I put the absolute value, they all become plus one. But do you remember Poincaré Hopf? It says that sum of the indices, sum of the index equals the Euler characteristic. So what do you think? If you have A plus B equals, say, C, if I put an absolute value everywhere, what do you get? You get greater than or equal to C. Do you realize this? In case B, for example, is negative and A is positive, C might end up becoming smaller because of some cancellation. But this is saying I'm now removing all the cancellations, so the 
sum of the absolute values is greater than or equal to the absolute value of the sum. Triangle inequality, if you like. So this is uh, greater than or equal to the absolute value of the sum, which is simply, by von Quantel hopf the Euler characteristic. End of proof. The theorem that we have just proved, namely that on even dimensional spheres, in particular on S2, every vector field, every field of arrows, every line field, every field of directions, on S2, every vector field must have an equilibrium. That theorem is sometimes called a hairy ball theorem. Let me explain why. Or from B. Do you know what hairy means? Somebody who has a lot of hair, or maybe who has a lot of body hair, and so on. That's hairy. Hairy ball theorem, or the impossibility. Forming a hedgehog. Do you know what a hedgehog is? Hérisson in French, but I'll draw a picture for you. So what we mean is the following. Suppose that you have a sphere, but which has a lot of hair, hair coming out from all over the place. Can you imagine such a thing? All directions. Yeah. And suppose that you want to make all those hairs tangent to the sphere. Can you do it in a smooth way, in a continuous way? Well, the theorem is that when, whatever you do, you must have end up with a place which looks like, for example, a source or sink. You cannot have this sort of aligned picture everywhere. And the reason is, you can regard the, this tangent picture, where the, uh, all the hair has been made, all the hairs have been made tangent, as a picture of a vector field. And this theorem says that because the Euler characteristic is two, non-zero, you have to have equilibria. Those are the points where you cannot um, have this kind of picture. A much better representation might be like this. Suppose that you have a hedgehog. In case you don't know what a hedgehog is in English, I'm sure you know in your own language, this is a hedgehog. So, but suppose this is a mathematical idealization of a hedgehog. Okay, it's not a real hedgehog, it's an idealized hedgehog. Suppose that hedgehog has lots and lots of hair. And you want to comb it. When you comb a hedgehog, you cannot comb it like this everywhere. You have to produce singularities like this. That's a, an interpretation of this theorem. Okay. Hairy ball theorem. Good. In order to understand the theorem that we have just proved, which is really, as I said, a prototype of how the topology constrains the behavior of a dynamical system on that manifold, Let's look at one or two examples by way of a remark. Okay, my eyesight is very bad. OK, so I see what's going on. OK. Remark 20. We understand this theorem a little better. It can be shown, although we will not quite show it because 
it gets, it's not difficult, but it takes slightly long, long discussion. And unfortunately, I am not here for a long time. That if, what about the converse? Suppose that the Euler characteristic is zero. That means that the number of equilibria of a vector field is greater than or equal to zero. Well, that's obvious, because the number is always positive. But the question is, is this equal inequality sharp? In other words, if the right-hand side becomes zero, can you make the left-hand side zero also? A greedy wish. It turns out that the answer is yes. Then, in this case, M admits, as we say, uh, an everywhere non-zero ve vector field. In other words, a vector field that has no equilibrium. Okay. That is um, maybe a, um, no equilibrium. Okay. This result, it can be shown that, is also due to the same Hopf of Poincare Hopf. I think in the same paper that he wrote um, in the 1920s. Let's show this by some examples. We already know that the Euler characteristic of T2 is 0, hmm? which means that although when we calculated the Euler characteristic from that rainfall picture, we had the equilibria, we should be able to draw a dynamic system or vector field on T2, two-dimensional torus, that has no equilibrium. And that's relatively easy. Imagine a torus like this. And <coughs> we shall consider the following motion on the torus. I just keep going around and around with, if you like, uniform speed, uniform angular speed. Clearly, this vector field or dynamic system has no equilibrium. It doesn't stop anywhere. And it's a completely generic picture. So there is no equilibrium. The number of equilibrium points is 0. That's OK. Another possibility you might like to go in this direction, in the other circular direction. So I'm, if you like, going from outside in. Can you visualize this? I have a torus like this. I'm just turning torus like this. Okay, so and underneath it just keeps going like this, like this, like this, like this, and so on. Hmm? And this vector field has no equilibrium either. Oh, these two pictures, although they look different, are in fact the same. Because think of the torus as made from a square. You remember how you can make a torus? I can identify this edge with this edge, and this edge with this edge, right? That's what it is. Well, this vector field is simply a vector field that goes this way, and this vector field is a vector field that goes this way. That's, that's all that is. So well, either I'm <coughs> rotating this like this, or rotating it like this. So it's the same picture. You don't have to draw this picture. I'll leave it. On. Anyway, so you can draw there exists a vector field with no equilibrium everywhere non-zero vector field. How about odd dimensional sphere? We also know that the Euler characteristic is zero. And according to this um, side remark by Hopf, we should be able to draw an everywhere non-vanishing, everywhere non-zero vector field. In the case of S1, it is extremely easy to do so. You should see this yourselves. This is S1. And on S1, let's put it the S1 inside R2, as I indicated. <coughs> you can just take a vector field which is going around and around like this. <coughs> yeah. It's a tangent vector field which simply rotates the circle, S1. And it's everywhere non zero, of course. You don't have to stop. Okay? 
Now, <coughs> let's write this in by a formula. So what is V? V of xy at the point xy, what is this? How can I write this in as a formula? Bless you. We worked on this example in the exercise session yesterday. Do you remember what the formula for? Huh? Minus y x, exactly. And it's obvious because minus 1x is equal to 0 minus 1, 1, 0 xy. What is this matrix? It's a rotation and by 90 degrees. So I take a radius vector. At this point, I take this vector, rotate it by 90 degrees, and then get this vector. OK? So that's, it's obvious that that must be the case. So this is the formula. Our business now is to generalize this to higher dimensional spheres of odd dimension. What happens on S3, for example, three-dimensional sphere, or S5, five-dimensional sphere, and so on? In general, let's do it on S2m minus 1, which is a subset of R2m, remember? Okay. If the sphere has odd dimension, the ambient Euclidean space in which the sphere sits has that dimension plus 1. Okay. <clears throat> you can consider the following vector field. Vector field at the point, instead of writing x1, x2, all the way to x2m, let me write the coordinates in a funny notation. x1, y1, x2, y2, all the way to xm, ym. Okay. How many coordinates are there? 2m coordinates. So we shall denote the coordinates on R2M like this. And the vector field at each point is simply going to be the generalization of the one dimensional case, namely minus y1, x1, minus y2, x2, and so on, going down to minus ym, xm. That's the vector field on the uh, sphere. When we say it's a vector field on a sphere, we have to check that this vector field is tangent to the sphere. But that's the same thing as saying it's perpendicular to the radius vector. But it's obviously perpendicular to the radius vector if you take the dot product of this with the position vector, which is x1, y1, x2, y2, and so on, it becomes 0. So it is tangent to the sphere. In words, on S2m minus 1, this V is everywhere perpendicular to <coughs> to the radius vector. So it is everywhere tangent to to the sphere, surface of the sphere. OK? Moreover, in order to show that this is the object we wanted, namely, not only a vector field on the odd dimensional sphere, but it's everywhere non-zero. That's our ambition. We are saying that if the Euler characteristic is zero, we can always construct that manifold always admits an everywhere non-zero vector field vector field without equilibrium, we have to check that it has no equilibrium. In other words, it never becomes zero. Well, you might say, wait a minute, it becomes zero at the origin. Ah, but the origin is not on the sphere. So, on the sphere, this vector field is every non zero on SM2M minus 1 because Look at the magnitude of v, v squared. It is equal to the sum over k, k from 1 to m, of all these components, which is equal to minus y, yk squared plus xk squared. Right? But what is this? Well, 
we are on the sphere, that is, the sum of these things must be equal to 1. And that's non zero. Okay? That's very good. Okay, that's more or less all that I wanted to uh, convey to you today. I shall close with a remark of slightly more advanced nature, but which you should be aware of in order to complete the picture so that we have a more honest picture of the subject. Last remark about this, remark 21. You remember that in all this discussion, we are visual, trying to visualize the tangent bundle. And in what we call picture number six, a long time ago, we visualized the tangent bundle of M, which was a fairly big and abstract object, locally as M cross R to M, where, of course, M is the dimension of this cell. Yeah? So the picture was we do M, and then we somehow imagine that you had a vertical direction Rm, a vector, a vector space, and then at each point of M, we attached a tangent space, which is essentially this, and we saw this kind of picture. And this kind of picture, of course, makes it look like the tangent bundle looks like the direct product of M and Rm. Right? But this picture is correct only locally. There do exist cases, in fact, typically, it is the case that globally, this picture as direct product or Cartesian product may be wrong. Let me explain why it can go wrong. More precisely, it is true that if you find this a little hard going, you can fall asleep. It's not going to matter. It is true that if you take a small neighborhood U, over that neighborhood, the part of the tangent bundle is a direct product. So for every small enough neighborhood. Neighborhood or open set. On M. But not globally. But it may happen. That all of the tangent bundle is not homeomorphic to the direct product of M together with RM. Let me explain. This is, in fact, very easy to understand. Why the tangent bundle cannot usually be the direct product of M and, and, and the vector space. You see, indeed, if that's the case, if the tangent bundle are always direct product, then, if that was the case, then, we should always be able to find an every non-vanishing vector field on all M, contrary to our discussion um, previously. What I mean is, if you have this, it's easy to write down an every constant vector field V of x, let's say, let's say you have those components. Yeah? Would be every non zero. On M. You see it's a every non zero because the first component is always one. Well. 
But by the theorem that we have just proved, theorem 19, we know that such a vector field, such a V, can exist only if the Euler characteristic is 0. And we know also that there are plenty of manifolds out there whose Euler characteristic is not 0. So something is going wrong. And what is going wrong is that, in fact, this tangent bundle, although we cannot really draw the picture um, at this level, some in fact, it can be drawn. In fact, the tangent bundle is usually twisted. And I'd like to mention that so that you might one day remember this expression when you study more advanced science, that how twisted, degree of twistedness, in other words, how twisted Tm is um, can be measured, it turns out, by things, objects, called characteristic classes. This is one of the main topics of topology, as used by physicists, applied mathematicians, and also, of course, pure mathematicians, scientists today, characteristic classes. And we have already seen a shadow of a characteristic class, how something is twisted. In fact, that Euler characteristic is precisely one example of this, whose um, most elementary manifestation, shall I say, shadow, is the Euler characteristic. All that is rather philosophical. So let me give you a very simple picture that conveys the flavor of what I'm talking about. Let's say that we take the ordinary strip, untwisted, and consider the middle of this strip. OK? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Things break. OK. So that's the mi middle of this strip. And please imagine that th this middle strip is like the zero section. OK? On this strip, I can draw a vector field, so to speak, which is, if you think of this as Tm, which is everywhere non-vanishing, everywhere non-zero. That is, I can draw a, an entire circle which does not intersect the middle line. That's very easy, right? I just draw this line a little above. And this circuit, if you like, does not intersect the orange line. That's very easy, the middle line. Here is an interesting thought. Let's take your favorite object, the movie strip, and consider its middle line, middle curve, like this. Question. Can you draw a curve that goes all the way around on this movie strip that does not intersect the middle, middle line? No. That's quite interesting. Here it was so easy. Let's try that here. You see, let's start here, for example. And, you know, very, very naively, I'm singing along, and I think it's going to be easy. I come around, come around, oh, it's going to be very easy, it's going to be very easy. And then I come down and I find myself here. And I promise myself that I just go around once. You remember, this is a bit like the picture of the section of a vector field. So in order to close, I must cross the middle section. Which means that I cannot avoid having an intersection, and in the language of the vector field, I must have, I'm forced to have, an equilibrium. 
Okay? So there are situations like this. When the tangent bundle is twisted, as you can see. And although that language has to remain rather metaphorical at this stage, there is a precise way of doing science of twisting and how twisted a tangent bundle is. And I'm saying that twistedness can be measured by those wonderful uh, mathematical objects called characteristic classes. Well done.